From the Art of Love, Book Two. Don't trust your good looks too much. A handsome body is not enough. Soft words and gentle ways have won more women than a mere show of strength. No one is fond of the wolf that attacks timid lambs or the hawk which pounces on its prey. A sweet tongue supplies the food of love, but a quarrelsome voice will estrange the most intimate pair of lovers. Your mistress will listen only to persuasion, not to force. No law compelled her to share her bed with you. For lovers, love is the only law. When your mistress is preoccupied or ungracious, do not be impatient. It is a woman's way to change her mind often. Patience will help her change it in your favor. If a branch is held carefully, it will bend to your will. If it is seized roughly, it will break. Let me put it simply. Whatever she says is correct. Whatever she does is right. If she says a thing isn't so, be prepared to agree wholeheartedly. Laugh when she laughs, weep with her when she weeps. Be a mirror for all her moods. When you play games with her, be sure to let her win. Let her always think herself your superior. When you go out with her, carry her parasol and make a path for her through any crowd. Always be ready with a chair for her toilet and a footstool to help her into bed. When her hands are cold, warm them in your bosom, even though you yourself are freezing. If you have an appointment with her in the forum, be sure to be there ahead of her. If she asks you to meet her somewhere else at the last minute, don't complain and don't let anything detain you. When she comes home tired and calls for a slave, if there is none available, offer yourself. If she is in the country and summons you, go at once, even if there is no conveyance and you have to walk. Love is a state of war, a long and tough campaign, nothing for the faint-hearted soldier. If her door happens to be locked, do not knock and disturb her. Climb through her window, or if necessary, go down the chimney. Remember Leander, who swam the Hellespont to prove he would do anything for the sight of his beloved. Get into the good graces of her servants, even the lowest. Bring some little gift to each one of them, and a particularly handsome present to her maid. It is not necessary to give your mistress only extravagant things, Sometimes a few flowers or a basket of fruit will show your thoughtfulness as well as your taste. What about poetry? For heaven's sake, no. Poetry is a drug on the market. You may never sing her praises often enough to satisfy her, but she won't care for pretty sentiments in verse. She may listen to your poem when you read it to her, especially if it happens to be written in her honor, but she will like it better if it is accompanied by a trinket or two. Remember, we are living in a golden age, and the sound of gold is more musical than tinkling syllables. Another piece of advice. Decide to do something that she will like. Then, make it appear that it was she who thought of it. If, for instance, you have made up your mind to free one of your slaves, let her ask you to do it as a favor. Probably she will feel that she can twist you about her finger. Let her think so. It is the surest way of getting what you want. Never stop praising her physical charms. Tell her that her beauty is so dazzling it outshines the sun. If she dresses in Tyrian purple, tell her that purple is your favorite color. If she wears a gown of thin material, tell her that nothing becomes her so well. If she decks herself out in gold, tell her that sparkling though it is, gold is less brilliant than she. When she wears furs, tell her that you wish it were always winter. If she appears in a transparent tunic, tell her that you hope she won't catch cold, but that she sets you on fire. If she wears her hair parted, insist that this is the most becoming way. But if she wears it curled, tell her that she is most adorable in curls. When she dances, praise her arms. When she sings, be ecstatic about her voice. When she stops, complain that it ended so soon. When she welcomes you to her bed, tell her that her bed is the very center of heaven. If you act like grow soft and docile, let her feel that you are always at hand to do her services. Let her see no one but you. Let her hear you only. Be available night and day whenever she needs you. 
Then, when you are confident that she has grown dependent on you, leave her for a while. Let your absence worry her a little. Remember how shrewd Ulysses proved his shrewdness by staying away from Penelope for a long time. But don't stay too long. Time cures everything, including anguish. Be on the safe side. When Menelaus left Helen for too protracted a period, she grew tired of her cold couch and warmed herself in the arms of her guest. It was all the fault of Menelaus. No one should blame Helen merely because she was afraid to sleep alone. Don't be afraid that, like some strict censor, I will insist that you remain faithful to one mistress only. God forbid. Even a married woman could not keep such a promise of fidelity. Amuse yourself, but be discreet. Don't brag about your conquests. Don't give presents to some woman that another of your favorites will recognize as coming from you. Be careful of what you write. Most women read between the lines. They usually read there more than was intended. If, in spite of all your efforts, your secret affairs are brought to light, deny them emphatically. Do not protest too much and never be on the defensive. Be bold, always bold. In love's battle, this is the only way to achieve peace. Some people will advise you to increase your virility by taking certain stimulants. Pepper mixed with thistle seeds, chamomile steeped in old wine, savory and other herbs. In my opinion, these are not aphrodisiacs, but poison. Nevertheless, the small white onions that come from Megara, mixed with eggs, honey and apples, may prove helpful. Although I advised you not to boast of your infidelities, there are times when it might be well to display your good luck in love affairs. A mistress often grows bored, and the threat of a rival will rouse her to new displays of affection. Even a fairly good fire will go out unless it is fed with fresh fuel. Sometimes a dash of sulphur will bring up new flames. Let your mistress worry a little. It is good for her, and for you too. Nothing makes a lover happier than to hear his mistress weeping because he has been unfaithful. First she refuses to believe the news, then she grows pale. Then her voice fails, then she raves and tears her hair. Finally, in a flood of tears, she forgives him because she says she knows he cannot live without her. This is your triumph. Throw your arms around her neck, hold her sad face to your breast, kiss away her tears. When the war is over between you, call for a truce. She will be glad to sign a treaty of peace in bed. Sometimes you may be told that your mistress is out when you know she is really at home. Never mind. Tell yourself that she has gone out, that your eyes deceive you. Perhaps some night after she has promised to receive you, you find her door shut. Do not rage. Lie down on the ground, even if it is cold and damp, and wait. A sensible man will understand the whims of women and will put himself rather than them in the wrong. But these are little things. Let us turn to more important subjects and more difficult situations. If you have a dangerous rival, put up with it. Believe me, this is not an easy thing to do, but once you accomplish it, your success is assured. If your mistress makes secret signs to your rival, ignore them. If she writes to him, do not try to intercept her letters. Let her come and go, wherever and whenever she likes. Frankly, I confess that in my own case, I have never achieved this state of perfection. Like many others, I have never been able to practice completely what I preach. My jealousy is so great that when one day I saw my mistress kiss her husband, I complained about it. There is nothing reasonable about love. At the same time, a really clever man allows his mistress to hide her infidelities. If you make her confess them, she will only grow more adroit at duplicity. Above all, do not try to surprise your mistress in the act, nor shame her in public. The temple of love is sacred, and the mistress practiced in it should never be disclosed. Even Venus is not without shame. Most of the statues show her modest hands covering her secret charms. Animals may copulate anywhere and in front of everyone, but at the sight, the young girl will turn her head away. Men and women seek private places and closed doors for lovemaking. They cover their nudity with clothes. Even when we do not want complete darkness, we certainly ask something dimmer than broad daylight. Don't whisper intimately with every young girl you meet, as though to say, 
That's another one I have slept with. There are men who like to do this in the hope that it will give them a reputation for gallantry, even though it makes the woman an object of scandal. Such men want you to believe that no woman can possibly resist them. If they cannot really possess a woman, they can dishonor her by implication. Whatever you do, never talk to your mistress about her faults. Don't even hint, however playfully, that she may have a single defect. Andromeda was so extremely swarthy as to be almost black, but to Perseus, she was the fairest of the fair. Most people found Andromache too tall, but Hector considered her exactly the right height. If there is something about your mistress you do not like, get used to it. Nothing is offensive to love. If her skin is black as pitch, call her a brunette. If her hair is carrot red, compare her to the Auburn and August Minerva. If she is nothing but skin and bones, tell her she is elegantly slender. If her waist is thick, praise her for her rosy plumpness. If she is short, extol her daintiness. Never ask her age. Never notice that she is growing older. Ignore the fact that she keeps pulling out gray hairs. Remember, older women are much more experienced and even more experimental in the art of love. They know how to vary the pleasures and postures of Venus. They can enhance your pleasure in a thousand different ways. All the pictures and statues, however voluptuous, cannot show so much diversity. I dislike the embraces in which both sides do not consummate. That is why boys give me little pleasure. Nothing is more unrewarding than making love to a woman when she is thinking about her housework. On the other hand, nothing is more exciting than the voice of the beloved heard in little gasps of pleasure, imploring her lover to go more slowly so that her happiness may be prolonged. Nothing can be sweeter than to behold her, drunk with ecstasy, her eyes swimming with delicious languor, holding off your caresses but increasing your desire. Do not hurry. Do not come too soon to the climax of your pleasure. Learn by skillful delayings to reach the end with gentle urgency. When you have found the most blissful sanctuary, do not let any stupid modesty arrest your hand. Then you will see her eyes tremble and shine. Then you will hear soft protests, broken sighs, and gentle moans which freshly stimulate desire. But beware, not too fast. Row together to the port on a mounting wave. Do not put on too much sail and reach the harbour, leaving your panting mistress behind, nor let her outstrip you on the way to the final haven. Do not hasten the last pleasure. If, however, there is danger in delay, do not be cautious. Dig deep into your courser's side and spur your way to victory. I am now at the end of my task. Award me the palm and crown my head with myrtle. Extol your poet, sing his praises. Let him be acclaimed by lovers everywhere. May everyone who has ever triumphed over some reluctant Amazon with weapons he has received from me inscribe upon his trophies, Ovid was our master. The Virgin Mistress, naked, and breast to breast we lie. She kisses, coaxes, teases. Her parted lips are eager. I press on, and then she freezes. She turns her mouth away, although my roving hand's unchided. Her body's soft and lithe, but so frustratingly divided. Part virgin mistress and part whore, one half she gives to passion, but oh, the half I hunger for, she dedicates to caution. Advice on the choice of a mistress. From a letter written in Philadelphia on June the 25th, 1745. My dear friend, I know of no medicine fit to diminish the violent natural inclinations you mention. And if I did, I think I should not communicate it to you. Marriage is the proper remedy. It is the most natural state of man, and therefore a state in which you are most likely to find solid happiness. Your reasons against entering into it at present appear to me not well founded. The circumstantial advantages you have in view by postponing it are not only uncertain, 
but they are small in comparison with that of the thing itself, the being married and settled. It is the man and woman united that make the complete human being. Separate, she wants his force of body and strength of reason, he, her softness, sensibility and acute discernment. Together they are more likely to succeed in the world. A single man has not nearly the value he would have in a state of union. He is an incomplete animal. He resembles the odd half of a pair of scissors. If you get a prudent, healthy wife, your industry and your profession with her good economy will be a fortune sufficient. But if you will not take this counsel and persist in thinking a commerce with the sex inevitable, then I repeat my former advice, that in all your amours you should prefer old women to young ones. You call this a paradox and demand my reasons. They are these. One, because they have more knowledge of the world and their minds are better stored with observations. Their conversation is more improving and more lastingly agreeable. Two, because when women cease to be handsome, they study to be good. To maintain their influence over men, they supply the diminution of beauty by an augmentation of utility. They learn to do a thousand services, small and great, and are the most tender and useful of friends when you are sick. Thus they continue amiable. And hence there is hardly such a thing to be found as an old woman who is not a good woman. Three, because there is no hazard of children, which irregularly produced, may be attended with much inconvenience. Four, because through more experience they are more prudent and discreet in conducting an intrigue to prevent suspicion. The commerce with them is therefore safer with regard to your reputation. And with regard to theirs, if the affair should happen to be known, considerate people might be rather inclined to excuse an old woman who would kindly take care of a young man, form his manners by her good counsels and prevent his ruining his health and fortune among mercenary prostitutes. Five, because in every animal that walks upright, the deficiency of the fluids that fill the muscles appears first in the highest part. The face first grows lank and wrinkled, then the neck, then the breast and arms, the lower parts continuing to the last as plump as ever, so that covering all above with a basket and regarding only what is below the girdle, it is impossible of two women to tell an old one from a young one. And as in the dark all cats are grey, the pleasure of corporal enjoyment with an old woman is at least equal and frequently superior, every knack being by practice capable of improvement. Six, because the sin is less. The debauching of a virgin may be her ruin and make her for life unhappy. Seven, because the compunction is less. The having made a young girl miserable may give you frequent bitter reflection, none of which can attend the making of an old woman happy. Eighth, and lastly, they are so grateful. Thus much for my paradox, but still I advise you to marry directly, being sincerely your affectionate friend, Benjamin Franklin. A handful of limericks. There was a young maiden of Siam who said to her lover, young Kayam, if you kiss me, of course, you will have to use force, but God knows you're stronger than I am. There was a young fellow of Lyme who lived with three wives at a time. When asked, why the third? He said, one's absurd, and bigamy, sir, is a crime. When the first select man took advantage of a lovely young lady of wantage, the county surveyor said, you'll have to pay her, for you've altered the line of her frontage. There was a young lady of Kent who said that she knew what it meant when men asked her to dine upon lobster and wine. She knew, oh, she knew, but she went. There was a young lady named Hopper who came a society cropper. She determined to go to Bordeaux with her beau. The rest of the story is improper. On the breast of a woman named Gail was tattooed the price of her tail, and on her behind, for the sake of the blind, was the same information in Braille. While Titian was mixing Rose Madder, his model was posed on a ladder. Her position to Titian suggested fruition, so he mounted the ladder and had her. There was a fool gardener of Leeds who swallowed six packets of seeds. In a month the poor ass was all covered with grass, and he could not sit down for the weeds. A niece of the late Queen of Sheba was promiscuous with an amoeba, 
This queer blob of jelly would lie on her belly and quivering murmur, Ich liebe. From the Art of Love, Book 3. Having just, so to speak, armed the Greeks against the Amazons, it seems only fair to furnish a few weapons to the Amazons for their struggle against the Greeks. It would be unfair to leave them defenceless in the eternal conflict between the sexes. Men would not relish a victory under such conditions. At this point, some man may object. Is it necessary to supply venom to the viper? My answer is that it is unfair to condemn the entire sex for the wrongdoings of a few. Virtue has always been depicted as a woman, not as a man, and it is only proper that she should befriend her own sex. However, I do not presume to instruct the virtuous and superior souls. I address myself to the light-hearted. I shall teach only those women who want to make themselves well-loved. For the most part, women are unfortunately ill-equipped to hold their men. They lack skill in lovemaking. A great deal of cleverness, artfulness, and even art are required to keep a lover from growing bored. I do this at the express command of Venus. Lately she appeared to me and spoke. What have these poor women done to you that you make things worse for them? You have devoted two books to instructing men how to win every victory on love's battlefield. It is only fair that you give some thought to my daughters. They too need your advice. Therefore, I am inspired by Venus. Listen to me carefully. Women, remember that although you may reject love today, there will come a time when you will long for lovers, and it will be too late. No roses will be strewn on your doorstep, and at the same time, the rose will fade from your cheeks. The dread wrinkles will come. The hair will lose its luster, and though you swear you are prematurely white-haired, no one will believe you. Only the snake which slips its skin and the stag, which sheds its horns, seem to retain their prime. It is better to pluck the flower than let it wither on the stem. The ancient goddesses were not backward when they fell in love. Venus pursued Adonis. Dawn carried off Cephalus. Phoebe was shameless about her passion for Endymion. Even if you are betrayed by men, what have you lost? Although many may enjoy your charm, the charm is still there. Iron corrodes. Stone thins down, but the part of you needed for love never wears out. A torch does not lose its brilliance merely because it is used to light another torch. The ocean does not shrink when water is drawn from it. You too lose nothing by giving yourself freely. You can be lavish with your gifts without ever growing poor. Be sure to hide all subterfuges from your lover. Do not let him behold you repairing the ravages of nature or see your dressing table full of pigments, salves, lotions and other beauty aids. No one could blame him for feeling uncomfortable if he suspected that the bloom on your cheeks might run down your neck. Avoid the Greek ointments which turn rancid and be careful of the oils which are extracted from the malodorous fleece of sheep. Never clean your teeth in front of anyone. Although the end result is commendable, the process is slightly disgusting. It is, of course, true that the most beautiful objects have crude origins. The sculptor's masterpieces were once nothing but shapeless marble blocks. The exquisite ring of gold was fashioned from a metal lump. The fine-spun material you are wearing probably came from an evil-smelling ram. So, if your lover arrives while you are still beautifying yourself, have your maid tell him you are still sleeping. Do not let him see an unfinished and imperfect product. On the other hand, I do not forbid you to have your hair done in his presence. Nothing is more enchanting than watching the waves of a woman's hair ripple down her back. Be cooperative with your hairdresser. Do not make her afraid of you. If you abuse her, she will have her revenge by doing something hateful behind your back. One day, I entered the boudoir of my mistress unannounced. In a flurry of excitement, she put on her false hair all awry. May such an awkward accident happen only to those we hate. A mutilated animal, a meadow without grass, a tree without leaves, and a head without hair, all are ugly. 
It is not to you, ravishing Semili, or lovely leader, that I speak. Not to you, Europa, carried away on the back of an enraptured bull. Nor to Helen, whom her husband Menelaus rightfully demanded, and whom her seducer Paris understandably refused to return. Most of my pupils are average women. The great beauties need little of my advice, but the plain ones, the great majority, will benefit by it. There are few faces without blemishes. Hide the flaws with skill and circumspection. Remedy the defects of your figure. If you are short, sit down most of the time. This way, men will not be aware of your lack of height. If you are so small as to be almost a dwarf, lie down and throw something over your feet. If you are thin, wear bulky materials. When you go out, put on a loose mantle. If you do not have shapely feet, do not expose them in sandals, but cover them with fetching shoes. If your neck is thick, veil it with a scarf. If your hands are large, restrain your gestures. If your bosom is flat, a few pads will help. If it is too large, wear a tight brassiere. If your breath is unpleasant, do not come too near your lover. Talk as little as possible when your stomach is empty. A woman whose teeth are discoloured or too large should be very careful about laughing. Now let us put aside the lesser weapons and take up the naked sword, even though I may foolishly be instructing you against my own sex. When you have got your lover in your net, let him think he's the only one you care to capture. Once, however, you get him in bed, let him suspect a rival. This device always sharpens a man's ardour. A racehorse makes better time when several other horses are competing with him rather than when he is running alone. Do not be too obvious about it. Pique him with stories of imaginary lovers. Pretend that some man's emissary is always pleading at your door. If you are married, delude him into the belief that your husband is violently jealous and watchfully suspicious. There are times when, though he might enter naturally by the door, you should insist that he creep in stealthily by the window. You might even create a dramatic scene. At the proper moment, have your maid rush in and cry out, We are discovered! To make up for such alarms, let there be nights when he has every pleasure without disturbance. At a banquet or any other formal meal, be sure to arrive late. Remain dignified and do not carouse until the evening is well advanced. Men who have been imbibing freely will find even a plain and modest girl alluring. Eat slowly and with delicacy. Handle the food only with the tips of your fingers. Do not leave greasy marks around your mouth. Wipe your hands often. Drink, but only a little. Love and wine are natural companions, but no one likes to see a woman drunk. Don't fall asleep after the meal. A sleeping woman is an open invitation to rape. I fear to go on, but Venus insists. That which you hesitate to disclose, she says, is the most important part of all. So, learn what postures suit you best in the arena of love. If your face is pretty, lie upon your back. If your hips are shapely, show them off. If you are short, be your lover's jockey. If you are tall, kneel. Remember that love has countless ways and poses. None of the oracles ever gave better advice than that which I have given you. Listen then to the end. Respond to your lover every moment. Let pleasure penetrate to the marrow of your bones. Share with him every delight. Whisper words of tenderness, or words which in their naughtiness will increase excitement. If, as with some women, you feel no pleasure, pretend an answering thrill. Do not overdo it. Time your exuberant cries and gasps of delight carefully. I have done. The swans hitched to my chariot are ready to carry me to the skies. And now my fair and promising pupils do as the men your lovers have already done. Inscribe upon your trophies, Ovid was our master. Some aphorisms of Oscar Wilde. Men marry because they are tired, women because they are curious. Both are disappointed. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. All women desire to be valued. They care much less about being respected. 
One can always recognize women who trust their husbands. They look so thoroughly unhappy. There is nothing in the world like the devotion of a married woman. It's a thing no married man knows anything about. No civilized man ever regrets a pleasure, and no uncivilized man knows what a pleasure is. The one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. I love scandals about other people, but scandals about myself do not interest me. They lack the charm of novelty. The public, as a mass, takes no interest in a work of art until it is told that the work in question is immoral. The Deceits of a Woman from the Golden Ass. There was a man dwelling in the town, very poor, who had naught but that which he got by the labour and travail of his hands. His wife was a fair young woman, but very lascivious, and given to the appetite and desire of the flesh. It fortuned on a day that while this poor man was gone betimes in the morning to the field about his business, according as he accustomed to do, his wife's lover secretly came into his house to have his pleasure with her. And so it chanced that during the time that he and she were busking together, her husband, suspecting no such matter, returned home, praising the chaste continency of his wife. And he found his doors fast closed, wherefore, as his custom was, he whistled to declare his coming home. Then his crafty wife, ready with present shifts, caught her lover and covered him under a great tub, standing in a corner. And therewithal she opened the door, blaming her husband in this sort. Comest thou home so every day with empty hands, and bringest nothing to maintain our house? Thou hast no regard for our profit, neither providest for any meat or drink. Whereas I, poor wretch, do nothing day and night but occupy myself with spinning, and yet my travail will scarce find the candles which we spend. Oh, how much more happy is my neighbour Daphne, who eats and drinks at her pleasure, and passeth the time with her amorous lovers according to her desire. What is the matter, quoth her husband? Though our master hath made holiday at the fields, yet think not but that I have made provision for our supper. Dost thou not see this tub that keeps a place here in our house in vain, and does us no service? Behold, I have sold it to a good fellow that is here present for fivepence. Wherefore I pray thee lend me thy hand, that I may deliver him the tub. His wife having invented a present shift, laughed on her husband, saying, What merchant, I pray you, have you brought home hither to fetch away my tub for fivepence, for which I, poor woman, that sit all day alone in my house, have been proffered so often seven? Her husband, being surprised at her words, demanded who he was that had bought the tub. Look, quoth she, he is gone under, to see whether it be sound or no. Then her lover, under the tub, began to stir and rustle himself, and to the end that his words might agree to the words of the woman, he said, Dame, will you have me tell the truth? This tub is rotten and cracked, as to me seemeth on every side. And then he turned himself to her husband, saying, I pray you, honest man, light a candle, that I may make the tub clean within, to see if it be for my purpose or no, for I do not mind to cast away my money willfully. He immediately, being a very ox, lighted a candle, saying, I pray you, good brother, put not yourself to so much pain. Let me make the tub clean and ready for you. Whereupon he put off his coat and crept under the tub to rub away the filth from the sides. In the mean season, this minion lover had his pleasure with the wife, and as he was in the midst of his pastime, he turned his head on this side and on that side, finding fault with this and that, till they had both ended their business, when he delivered sevenpence for the tub and caused the good man himself to carry it on his back to his inn. Upon the Nipples of Julia's Breast Have ye beheld with much delight a red rose peeping through a white? Or else a cherry double-graced within a lily's centre placed? Or ever marked the pretty beam a strawberry shows, half drowned in cream? Or seen rich rubies blushing through a pure smooth pearl, and orient too? So like to this, nay, all the rest, is each neat nipplet of her breast. Putting the Devil into Hell being the third day and the tenth story from the tales of Boccaccio. In the city of Capsa in Barbary, there lived a very rich man who, among his other children, had a fair and winsome young daughter by name Alibek. She, 
not being a Christian, and hearing many Christians who abode in the town mightily extol the Christian faith and the service of God, one day questioned one of them in what manner one might avail to serve God with the least hindrance. The other answered that they best served God who most strictly eschewed the things of the world, as those did who had betaken them into the solitudes of the deserts of Thebes. The girl, who was maybe fourteen years old and very simple, moved by no ordered desire but by some childish fancy, set off next morning by stealth and all alone to go to the desert of Thebes without letting any know her intent. After some days, her desire persisting, she won with no little toil to the deserts in question, and seeing a hut afar off, went thither, and found at the door a holy man, who marvelled to see her there, and asked her what she sought. She replied that, being inspired of God, she went seeking to enter into his service, and was now in quest of one who should teach her how it behoved to serve him. The worthy man, seeing her young and very fair, and fearing lest, and he entertained her, the devil should beguile him, commended her pious intent, and giving her somewhat to eat of roots, of herbs, and wild apples and dates, and to drink of water, said to her, Daughter mine, not far hence is a holy man who is much better master than I, of that which thou goest seeking. Do thou betake thyself to him, and put her in the way. However, when she reached the man in question, she had of him the same answer, and fearing father came to the cell of a young hermit, a very devout and good man, whose name was Rustico, and to whom she made the same request as she had done to the others. He, having a mind to make a trial of his own constancy, sent her not away as the others had done, but received her into his cell, and the night being come, he made her a little bed of palm fronds, and bade her lie down to rest thereon. This done, Temptations tarried not to give battle to his powers of resistance, and he, finding himself grossly deceived by these latter, turned tail without awaiting many assaults and confessed himself beaten. Then, laying aside devout thoughts and orisons and mortifications, he fell to revolving in his memory the youth and beauty of the damsel, and bethinking himself what course he should take with her, so as to win to that which he desired of her, without her taking him for a debauched fellow. Accordingly, having sounded her with sundry questions, he found that she had never known man, and was in truth as simple as she seemed. Wherefore, he bethought him how, under colour of the service of God, he might bring her to his pleasure. In the first place, he showed her with many words how great an enemy the devil was of God, and afterwards gave her to understand that the most acceptable service that could be rendered to God was to put the devil into hell, whereto he had condemned him. The girl asked him how this might be done, and he, Thou shalt soon know that, do thou but as thou shalt see me do. So saying, he proceeded to put off the few garments he had, and abode stark naked, as likewise did the girl, whereupon he fell on his knees as he would pray, and caused her abide over against himself. Matters standing thus, and Rustico being more than ever inflamed in his desires to see her so fair, there came the resurrection of the flesh, which Alibek observing and marvelling, Rustico, quoth she, what is that I see on thee, which thrusteth forth thus, and which I have not? Faith, daughter mine, answered he, this is the devil thereof I bespoke thee, and see now, he giveth me such sore annoy that I can scarce put up with it. Then said the girl, now praised be God, I see I fare better than thou, in that I have none of yonder devil. True, rejoined Rustico, but thou hast other what that I have not, and thou hast it instead of this. What is that? asked Alibek. And he, thou hast hell, and I tell thee, methinketh God hath sent thee hither for my soul's health, for that when as this devil doth me this annoy, and it please thee have so much passion on me as to suffer me put him back into hell, thou wilt give me the utmost solacement, and wilt do God a very great pleasure and service. So indeed thou be come into these parts to do as thou sayest. The girl answered in good faith, Marry, father mine, since I have hell, be it whensoever it pleaseth thee. Whereupon, quoth Rustico, Daughter, blessed be thou. Let us go then, and put him back there, so he may after leave me in peace. So saying, he laid her on one of the little beds, and taught her how she should do to imprison that accursed one of God. 
The girl, who had never yet put any devil in hell, for the first time felt some little pain. Wherefore, she said to Rustico, Certes, father mine, this same devil must be an ill thing and an enemy in very deed of God, for that it irketh hell itself, let be other what, when he is put back therein. Daughter, answered Rustico, it will not always happen thus. And to the end that this should not happen, six times, or ever they stirred from the bed, they put him in hell again, insomuch that for the nonce they so took the conceit out of his head that he willingly abode at peace. But it returning to him again and again the ensuing days, and the obedient girl still lending herself to take it out of him, it befell that the sport began to please her. And she said to Rustico, I see now that those good people in Capsa spoke sooth, when they avouched that it was so sweet a thing to serve God. For certes, I remember me not to have ever done aught that afforded me such pleasure and delight as putting the devil in hell. Wherefore methinketh that whoso applieth himself unto aught other than God, his service is a fool. Accordingly, she came oft times to Rustico and said to him, Father mine, I came here to serve God and not to abide idle. Let us go put the devil in hell. Which doing, she said whiles, Rustico, I know not why the devil fleeth away from hell, for an he abode there as willingly as hell receiveth him and holdeth him, he would never come forth therefrom. The girl then, on this wise often inviting Rustico and exhorting him to the service of God, so took the bombast out of his doublet that he felt cold what time another had sweated. Wherefore, he fell to telling her that the devil was not to be chastised nor put into hell, save when as he should lift up his head for pride. And we, added he, by God's grace have so baffled him that he prayeth our Lord to suffer him abide in peace. And on this wise he for a while imposed silence on her. However, when she saw that he required her not of putting the devil into hell, she said to him one day, Rustico, even if thy devil be chastened, and give thee no more annoy, my hell letteth me not be. Wherefore thou wilt do well to aid me with thy devil, in abating the raging of my hell, even as with my hell I have helped thee take the conceit out of thy devil. Rustico, who lived on roots and water, could ill avail to answer her calls, and told her that it would need over many devils to appease hell, but he would do what he might thereof. Accordingly, he satisfied her by times, but so seldom it was but casting a bean into the lion's mouth. Whereat the girl, believing she served not God as diligently as she would fain have done, murmured somewhat. While this debate was going on between Rustico, his devil, and Alibek, her hell, for overmuch desire on the one part and lack of power on the other, it befell that a fire broke out in Capsa and burnt Alibek's father in his own house, with as many children and other family as he had. By reason of this, she became heir to all his estate. Thereupon, a young man called Nearbale, who had spent all his substance in gallantry, hearing that she was alive, set out in search of her. Finding her, before the court had laid hands upon her father's estate, to Rustico's great satisfaction but against her own will, he brought her back to Capsa, where he took her to wife and succeeded, in her right, to the ample inheritance of her father. There. Being asked by the women at what she served God in the desert, she answered, Nearbail having not yet lain with her, that she served him at putting the devil in hell, and that Nearbail had done a grievous sin in that he had taken her from such service. The ladies asked, How putteth one the devil in hell? And the girl, what with words and what with gestures, expounded it to them, whereat they set up so great a laughing that they laugh yet, and said, Give yourself no concern, my child. Nay, for that is done here also, and near Baal will serve our Lord full well with thee at this. Therefore, telling it from one to another throughout the city, they brought it to a common saying there that the most acceptable service one could render to God was to put the devil in hell, which by word having passed the sea hither is yet current here. Wherefore do all you young ladies who have need of God's grace learn to put the devil in hell, for that this is highly acceptable to him and pleasing to both parties, and much good may grow and ensue therefrom. Strictly for the gods. Great Jupiter, for love or lechery, became a bull, a swan, a shower, a ram. 
such tricks delight the gods. But as for me, I pay my girl and stay the way I am. <laughs>